We need to work hard because this was a problem before the lockdown. This message uh, just wasn't penetrating. This wellness message of what's available. And so I'm hoping that this accelerates because as we, we can circle back around, I'm expecting things to get worse before they get better in terms of mental health. I'm Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal software provider. In each episode of Daily Matters, we'll explore what this new normal means for law firms, how legal professionals can find success while working remotely, and how lawyers can best serve their clients during this unprecedented situation. To close out Mental Health Week, we have Brian Cuban, the best-selling author of The Addicted Lawyer and an addiction recovery advocate who has presented to audiences across the United States and Canada. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time with, to be here with us today. Thanks for having me. So, Brian, I'm interested to start off. If you could tell us what's on your mind most right now. Uh, what's on my mind at this moment, uh, going through uh, what we are all going through is uh, obviously uh, a little bit of apprehension and what my life is going to look like down the road, the safety of my family, uh, my safety, the safety of people out there. But I'm also have positive things that are going on. I'm finishing up my first novel. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you, called The Ambulance Chaser. I am, uh, I am reinventing my, I am reimagining myself as we talked about and figuring out what my occupation will look like as a public speaker moving forward. And, I'm, and there's opportunity and excitement. So there are good things happening. So you're, to tell us a, a little bit more about how your professional life is being, being transformed by this. Tell us a little bit more about what you, what you do, what your day-to-day -day used to look like, and maybe what it is transforming into over the course of this pandemic. Sure. I no longer practice law. I haven't for years. I have made my living as a public speaker for the last at least six or seven years. And in the last couple of years, the primary... Uh, my primary clientele and audience uh, has been law firms and recovery organizations. Last year, my primary legal audience was going into big law firms uh, mm -hmm. all over the country. Uh, Winston and Strawn, uh, Quinn Emanuel, all, all over, O'Melveny and Myers. And now, obviously, that is not going to happen. So I went from doing that to having to figure out what I will do because I don't see myself being brought in to do those things for quite a while. And that's okay because, again, it's uh, a bit stressful in terms of income, but uh, it's also opportunity. And I have, uh, re I have recorded my keynote in a virtual setting. It was just used by the Mississippi Bar Association. So things are starting to change around. I created my own green screen studio that you can't see, but uh, I will be I will be uh, producing Wellness Wednesday clips targeted towards the legal profession in the recovery industry. So I am staying busy and I have a plan and I'll just keep moving forward. That, that's great. And so many of us are needing to pivot and, and evolve our, our business models uh, over the course of COVID-19. And, and I want to talk more about what you're doing on that front. But first, I, I wish every lawyer had a chance to, to hear your story. And I, I think it's an important one to share. But for those that that haven't, are you able to share a, a condensed version of your story with our audience? Sure, let me give you, let's, I am in recovery from uh, cocaine addiction, alcohol use disorder, quote unquote alcoholism. And I put it in air quotes because alcoholism is not a diagnosis. Um, mm -hmm. The diagnosis is alcohol use disorder. Okay. I am in recovery from two types of bulimia, exercise, and traditional bulimia, binging and purging, and exercise bulimia is obsessive compulsive exercise for the primary purpose of offsetting calories. And I have struggled with episodes of major depression most of my life. I uh, came near suicide in 2005. I've uh, had two visits to a psychiatric hospital. And that kind of gives you the, but I, I had 13 years in recovery, April 8th. So I'm moving forward and things uh, are good on that front today, one day at a time. I'll give you a, a quick example of my life in addiction, the insanity of addiction. June of 2006, the Dallas Mavericks are going to the NBA championship for the very first time. My brother Mark had bought the team in January of 2000, and we had had some success going to the playoffs, but it was our first trip to the big show. Right. As you might imagine, I was going to get some pretty good seats for those games, right? I can imagine. 
Yes. I, I had the yin. I had the connection. Right. Yeah. I also had the opportunity to get two nice seats for friends. I call up my brother, Mark, and says, sure, come over. I get the tickets. Do you think I gave them to my friends? No. I know you're probably thinking I sold them on eBay for some astronomical old man, right? The profession of thinkers, I'm a lawyer. Right. Didn't do that either because that would be disrespectful to Mark, to, to the team. I took those two tickets to trade them into my cocaine dealer for $1,000 in cocaine in my 20th years as a practicing lawyer, 20th years of practicing lawyer. Trading them on, selling them on eBay was disrespectful, but selling them to my cocaine dealer made perfect sense to me. This is how the right. mind works in addiction. <laughs> right. My dealer shows up at my house. I was high class. He delivered. He gives me this giant baggie of cocaine, Ziploc. I go running. I give him the tickets. I go running up to my home office. I dump it out on this wooden desk. Look at it. This pile of cocaine, my cocaine kingdom. I wanted to go <laughs> right there in the nose like Scarface. And of course, I have to do some. That's why I bought it. Roll up the dollar bill that's been God knows where, stuck up whose nose. <laughs> With the credit card, do some. But cocaine had long stopped giving me the feeling of self-love and self-acceptance that I achieved when I did it in a bathroom in Dallas, Texas for the first time in 1987 that summer. Now it was just pain and shame and chasing the high and paranoia. Do I hear the cops outside? Woo, woo, woo. Go out the window. <laughs> Who's out there? Who's out there? I take the cocaine. I put it back in the Ziploc baggie. I hide it. I drive to a Home Depot. I buy electrical faceplate outlets, a drill, and a saw. I drive back to my house. I walk upstairs to the drywall in the closets with the drill. Bzz, 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 bzz. I create fake electrical outlets in the closets upstairs. I take the cocaine. I put it in smaller Ziploc baggies. I hide it behind these fake electrical outlets, close it back up, bzz, 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 thinking I am the smartest lawyer ever. Like right. the DEA, the cops, and the drug dogs have never thought of that. <laughs> and they'll never find it. I do some more, and again, just trying to chase that high, chase that high. But it wasn't, it, wasn't, it was never maybe I have a problem. It was, well, maybe I need a new dealer. Maybe I need to change out the Grey Goose for the Jack Daniels to get the right balance. Mm -hmm paranoia again. I go back to each closet, bzz, 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 take the cocaine out, put it back in the giant Ziploc baggie, go to my upstairs bathroom, flush it down the toilet. Wow. The next morning comes, and it so often happened when a perceived negative event gets in the rearview mirror around addiction, I wake up, I'm such an idiot. Did I really flush now $900 worth of cocaine down the toilet last night? There's another game. Another call to my brother, get two more tickets, another call to my drug dealer. He comes over my house again. He says, dude, did you do all that last night? I didn't want to tell him I flushed it down the toilet. Yes, I did it all. I need more. Okay, here you go. Back up to my home so office. Your, your drug dealer is close to telling you you have a problem. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's happy. He, he, he knows who, who's, who's paying him. Yeah. I dump all the cocaine out of my desk again. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> again, pain and shame and paranoia. Bzz, 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 bzz. I hide it again. I take it back out. I go to the bathroom again, drop to my knees like I had done so many times before, hoping, praying, wanting someone or something to take away the pain and shame of my substance use and flushed it all down the toilet again. They say when Dallas flushes, it ends up in Houston. So I think some people in Houston had a little <laughs> hop in their step that night. <laughs> I can the imagine. quote unquote, insanity of addiction, doing things over and over, expecting the same way and expecting a different result. That was and, and my life. That encapsulates us, my life. So, 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 it, it, it does sound in, insane in, in, in every way imaginable. Where, where was this episode in your, in your trajectory uh, from... Was, was, this the, was this rock bottom? And, and where did your path to recovery start? Oh, that, wasn't, that wasn't even, I mean, I, let, let's, let, let, let's talk about rock bottom for two seconds. I don't like that phrase because okay. rock bottom uh, has taken on this aura, this definition, this societal meaning that the worst has to happen to us in our lives for, to find recovery. 
You have to wipe out a family going the wrong way on a highway. You have to end up in jail. You have to this, that. That's not true. The goal should be to recover as high as possible, right? Right. The goal, should, I prefer recovering tipping point. That was not my recovery tipping point. All right. That, yeah. that was in 2006 and that was uh, June. So that was a year, that was a year and a half before I had my recovery tipping point about. And that, that's an interesting Interesting phrase, and I, I, I like it. Tell us what recovery tipping point means to you, and, and what did it look like for you? It was the recovery tipping point for me was Easter weekend 2007, my second trip to the same psychiatric facility, standing in that parking lot waiting for intake and realizing that there wouldn't be a third trip dead. I'd back, I'd be dead. And it was after a two day drug and alcohol induced blackout where my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, came in and found me passed out in my room. I realized standing in that parking lot that my family has was really had enough and I was going to lose my family, not lose their, not lose their love mm -hmm. because they love me, but lose they family's distance, right? Fam family's distance. I had to take that first step myself. And I realized that it was time. And I don't know why then and not in 2005 when I, my brothers came in and I had a 45 automatic on my nightstand and was going to end my life by suicide. Why not in 2006? I don't know, but that was the time. Everything is a progression of resilience learning. And so sometimes the recovery taking point, recovery tipping point takes a progression of cumulative learning moments that you may not even realize are learning moments uh, consciously. And it all came together for the tipping point to be in that moment. And, and that what is it is when I began my journey forward into recovery, Easter weekend, 2007. And tell us more about what that, that journey to recovery looked like once you passed that into, tipping point. That, that next day I walked into my psychiatrist's office who I'd been seeing for a couple of years and lying to, lying to, lying to, just getting my antidepressants while I'm also doing cocaine and drinking. That works out well. Why, why, I get asked, why would you lie to your psychiatrist? You're paying this guy. Shame knows no hourly rate. That is why I was ashamed. And so we finally got, I finally started getting honest, getting vulnerable, uh, taking that first step in, of vulnerability, which was scary. Uh, and he said, well, would you consider going to residential treatment? And I refused. I was much too important a lawyer to go to residential treatment, even though I had no cases left. My legal career had imploded. Would you consider 12 step? And I remember getting all angry and I'm not going to 12 step. There are no lawyers in 12 step. I walked in there and half of the people were lawyers I knew. <laughs> and for those who don't know, uh, tw the most well-known 12 step is Alcoholics Anonymous, although there are other types of 12 step programs. Okay. And, and so uh, I did agree to go to 12 step and began that journey April 8th of 2007, began a more serious, honest, therapy, underlying therapy, many different types of therapy. And I've been in long-term recovery since then. And, and finally, tell us about becoming a, a mental health advocate, Brian, when you, when you started, you, you wrote your book, The Addicted Lawyer, you're now speaking nationally. What did that journey look like for you? That journey started well before I wrote The Addicted Lawyer. That journey began when I wrote a book called Shattered Image, which was primarily about my eating disorder and body image issues, body dysmorphic disorder. And for people who don't know what body dysmorphic disorder is, it's when someone takes a small or even non-existent imagined defect in their body, a mole on their face, their hair, their stomach. For me, it was my stomach. And exaggerates their reflection in the mirror till it uh, affects their ability to function, quote unquote, normally in life. And for me, that was a real problem because a lot of my destructive behaviors revolved around what I saw in the mirror, or what I imagined I saw which was this huge stomach. And so I finally, it, it was back in, I want to say 2008 or so, I finally went public that I was, uh, had struggled with bulimia. And then I wrote the book and that kind of began my journey uh, into the recovery space. And then I wrote uh, The Addicted Lawyer a few years ago because in that journey and during my time, I ran into a lot of other lawyers who struggled and I felt there was a void in our profession of people who were speak, who were willing to speak up about their struggles. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. And the, the legal profession, is, especially you've spoken about this quite a bit, but I'd love for you to, to talk about it on the show here. 
the legal profession already has struggles with with predominant or much higher rates of mental uh, health issues, of depression, of suicide, of substance abuse issues. Um, and, and this pandemic is not doing anything to, uh, to, to help that. Can, can you talk a little bit about what the landscape looked like for lawyers pre-COVID-19 and maybe what sure. additional stressors had, you think are layering in here? Sure, from the problems drinking dan- standpoint, alcohol use disorder, alcoholic, uh, we had, uh, we had a, we have, according to the ABA, Betty Ford Hazelton study, which uh, a lot of people know about and a lot of people don't. Did you know about it? Uh, because of your podcast. Uh, there you go. See? A year ago, I know about it. I do. Yep. Yeah. So it's, uh, but uh, it found that uh, it was uh, going on about three years ago now. Uh, we have a uh, overall of the licensed attorneys about a 20 to 21% problem drinking rate. So if you want to, put it in the vernacular, 20 to 21% of licensed attorneys would be alcoholics. We have an extremely high depression rate, a very high anxiety rate, and these are all exponentially greater than the norm. It's To put it in perspective, it was a few years ago, I read a CNN article that said, uh, that talked about the overall drinking rate, the overall quote unquote problem drinking alcoholic rate in the US, and they said it was about 11, 10 or 11%. And so look at our profession, 21 percent, 20%, 21%. And if you are a millennial lawyer, and I use that as an age demographic versus any kind of label other than that, lawyers, I believe it was under 10 years of practice. The problem drinking rate goes over 30%. And if you are a female lawyer, it's even higher. Interesting. So we are a, the, the article said we are a nation in crisis from a drinking standpoint. Well, what are we in the legal, uh, what are we from, from a legal standpoint with those numbers? And if you look at the uh, ALM survey that was done just uh, six months ago, uh, these lawyers who considered suicide uh, were, it was like 18, it was about 18%. It was, and we have the fourth highest suicide rate overall of, of professions. And it seems like every other month I'm reading about a colleague who has tragically died by suicide. And so if we take it- So a a grim landscape to begin with. It's a grim landscape to begin with. And you can only expect the landscape to get bleaker when we are into social isolation. We are into layoffs and big law. We are into law firms, uh, solo practitioners, no longer able to sustain their practices. And so it, the, the landscape gets even bleaker. And I have a feeling when the data is looked at post-COVID, and somebody's going to look at this data, obviously, uh, we are going to see these rates off the charts. And so that's why you see, obviously, the explosion of uh, law firms and lawyers all, all talking about mindfulness and things we can do. And I'm, I'm, I'm among those lawyers as well, trying to talk about ways we can uh, create a compassionate community so we can support each other. And that's very important because uh, we are physically distanced and touch is important. Physical closeness is important. And so certain people may only get so much from the ability to Zoom or they may not want to Zoom or it may not help them at all. So we have to find ways to deal with this. And I'm not expecting good things when we come out of this in the way uh, that landscape looks, but we will find ways to uh, to move forward. We have done the things we can from what I've seen in the legal profession in terms of uh, offering the ability for people to connect uh, in the best way we can. So we'll see how it shapes out going forward. So what are some of those bits of advice you might share uh, with, with our audience that that are struggling. One of the reasons we focused on on speaking to people like you this week, uh, Brian, is that you, you've been through it and you've developed a lot of useful tools that you can you can share out for for how to navigate sure. situations like COVID nineteen. How to navigate the stress of being a lawyer? Can you can you share what some of your key learnings are with our audience? Sure. One of the things I found, and I learned this from recovery, and frankly, in the twelve step room, I learned this. We get all kinds of little sayings in 12 steps, some you cringe at, but some have real world uh, application. 
And one of the things that I had to get good with, which is tough right now, is taking things one day at a time, one step at a time. When this first broke, when we got the first stay at home order, I was like everyone else. I'm freaking out. Uh, how am I going to make a living next year? How am I going to make a living in two or three months? I go to the John Hopkins COVID website, refresh, refresh. Oh my God. Oh, refresh. Right. Oh no. Doom surfing so, is the term I've yeah, heard. Yeah, the, I at the that. obsessive, uh, compulsive, uh, uh, kind of try confirmation bias of the things as bad as they can possibly be. So I thought back to what I learned in recovery. Okay, wait a minute. What is going on today? What do I need to do today? How can I make my life better today? What is the next right thing I can do today? And I created that for my life, and that'll look different for everyone. And that calmed me down a lot. That brought me to a lot calmer state, which allowed me to think much clearer. One of the things I've started doing, and this isn't something that is directed at people suffering from severe depression because I know this doesn't work. And so if you are suffering from that, I get that. I started getting dressed. I started putting on my jeans instead of my sweats right. or my, the littlest thing, instead of my sweats or walking around in my pajamas all day, except when I have to leave the house for something. I'd even been going out to get my mail in my pajamas and this and that. I started getting dressed like I would uh, for a regular day pre-COVID. And for me, that has helped me be more productive. Little things, routine, little routine things. Yeah, I, I think that small things can have a big impact. I've also heard uh, and, and read in, in other places this idea that focusing on something positive in the near term that you can look forward to. You can't be thinking about the vacation you're going to take in a year when this is all over, but think about the, the nice steak you're going to enjoy with your wife right. tonight me, or something. Let me give you an example for me. It was very self-destructive for me to keep thinking about, okay, when's, when, when am I gonna be invited to my next conference? When am I gonna be invited to my next law firm to speak? It's, what if it never happens? What am I gonna do with my life? That, that was becomes a self-fulfilling depression generator. And so what am I going to do today? I'm going to create a video. I am going to talk about some things I've learned to benefit other people who might help one person. And so I started thinking of the things I can do to help others. Because that is, wasn't that the overall goal for me prior to COVID when I speak? My goal when I speak is that if one person can connect with something in my story and feel not so alone, that's it. That's, that, that's the brass ring. Right. Not payment, not uh all those things that shape a to shape a uh, income generating profession but before all that what was the goal before all that it was to help one person so that's how i look at each day what can i do today so one person won't feel so alone and this is what this segues into one of the other uh things that i talk about creating your compassion wheel Draw a circle, you're in the middle. Put a spoke out from each circle. Create a list of people that you can talk to to deal with all your feelings or create a list of people that you can talk to to help them deal with their feelings. To help that you, some of them you may not have talked to in a while and close the wheel. Every day, pick a person and you are either giving or receiving. Do that. That's an easy thing to do. And it, it, I'm sure it has bigger impact than you can imagine when you start practicing that. And it does. And one of the things I found is that stops people from doing this, and anecdotally, I've heard it more than once, I can't burden them with my problems. They're going through it too. They're going through it too. I can't, my sister, she's got three kids. My friend's got three kids. That They're, they're homeschooled. I can't. It's, I'll just sit here in social isolation instead of reaching out. I can't speak to your specific situation, but people want to be connected. People are, people, we are programmed for connection. They want to be connected. Instead of projecting out the worst possible scenario, call them, text them. 
They probably Reach want out. to hear from you. They probably so, want to help you feel less, more connected. Um, Brian, before uh, we started recording, one of the things we talked about was the, you know, the way events are, are changing and, and how virtual events will, events will really start to become a, a major part of how people hear speakers like you spreading their message. What are some of your thoughts in terms of how people can be accessing, you know, resources and help uh, in, in a time like this where, where we're maybe distanced and physically limited from even running into people that might normally be able to, to, to help us? It, it, it feels like a situation that would, you know, potentially exacerbate uh, mental sure. health issues yeah. and make people feel more isolated than ever. Sure. The, the, if, if you're struggling, even if you don't have a mental health issue to your, but you're just struggling, right? I mean, that happens. There's norm, there is normative struggling. Because you're struggling, because you're depressed today, uh, because you have anxiety today, doesn't necessarily mean you have this diagnosed mental health issue. There is normative struggle that we all right. go through. And so you don't have to be going through a severe mental health issue to go to your lawyer's assistance program website and look at all the resources, connection resources that they add all the time. They have become much more virtually, uh, vir virtually oriented. So go to your lawyer's assistance program websites. If you need to be connected, there are, uh, what's it called, Slack? Uh, yep. Go to the lawyer's groups. Uh, use, rely on your, if you have a listserv, rely on your listserv. Uh, you, but you, if you sit there in isolation, it's going to become self-fulfilling. And again, I know that's hard, especially if you're suffering from severe depression, because no one knows better than me that if I'm lying in bed in a major depressive episode, someone telling me to get out and get dressed isn't going to do it, right? That's why it's major depression. It takes more than that. And I'm not addressing that. That right. is a totally separate uh, mental health issue. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. When, when you talk about the difference between normative struggling and, and what might be uh, something that's much more dangerous, can, can you tell us what some of the warning signs are that you're, you're dealing with something that may need a, a medical diagnosis and treatment? I want to tread lightly here because I am not a doctor. I am not a therapist. Uh, it is not my place to diagnose any other people but myself. So right. I will say that for me, when I was going through major depressive episodes. Yeah, maybe put differently, what could you have recognized in, in your own uh, behavior earlier? I, I would uh, stay in bed the entire day. I would cry often. Uh, I, would, I had no joy. I, my, uh, I would not, my grooming suffered incredibly. I wouldn't shower, I wouldn't shave. And these are things that, unfortunately, right now, these are things that are going to be difficult to notice uh, unless you have a significant other, unless you have roommates, uh, because you can't see that by Zoom, right? We put on our best face in Zoom. So just like we put on our best face in Facebook, even when we're struggling or social media. So this is why that compassion wheel becomes so important. It is on us to be givers to the people that we can't see right on that wheel so those are some of the things i went through and some of the things you obviously can't see are uh severe suicidal ideation that i went through and th this maybe ties into the the concept of the compassion wheel but when you uh, appeared on our original matters podcast last year you spoke about this idea of not minding your own business when it comes to mental health and substance abuse. Can you revisit that concept for our sure. listeners? Sure, not minding your own business is integral to the compassionate community and can be part of the compassion wheel. You have the person, you're a giver. Not minding your own business, you can be part of a compassionate community with five words. How are you doing today? But you have to connect that. You have, and that's just not texting it. You have to have a conversation because you have to be willing to be able to utilize empathy and utilize compassion on almost a physical without being physically connected. So you ask somebody how they're doing and they may say, I'm doing okay, I'm doing fine. And 
the response is okay, but do you know that if you're struggling, you can reach out to me? The two ask rule. You may not get a response. They may say, I'm fine. But what has happened with the two ask rule is you have become a compassionate community cog in a long line of cumulative touch points. If everyone would be part of a compassionate community, if everyone, theoretically, if everyone used the two ask rule, I asked, I'm fine. The, the uh, significant other asked, okay, that's one more, I'm fine. And now the third person asked and it's cumulative and boom, yes, I, I'm ready to talk. You don't even know that you were part of that, right? When that person was ready to talk. Right. I've had that happen. They said, Brian, <clears throat> when you came to me and when you reached out to me, I wasn't ready, but I never forgot it. And I finally was ready. That's the, that is a cumulative to ask compassionate community continuum. And to, to this, uh, I, I think this shows one of the reasons your, your, your phrase of the tipping point is so much more powerful than, than the idea of rock bottom where you're, you're doing something that helps somebody build toward that tipping point. That's right. I mean, recovery is not a bright line process. Uh, mental health of just, Feeling happy, feeling content is never a bright line process. It's always zigzags, yeah. detours, but it's cute. But overall, the goal, the destination, right? Okay, the detour here, the destination, the destination, the destination. And the goal is cumulatively to get to the destination. So, Brian, on this podcast and, and, and elsewhere, I've heard many bar leaders and law firm leaders talk about the fact that they, they, they know their, their members, their uh, employees, the partners in their firm are struggling with mental health issues. They, they know that those problems are being uh, exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis uh, and they're looking for ways to support. Uh, what advice do you have okay. for people in those, those kinds of leadership roles for what they can be doing to, let, 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 let's break this into three different demographics. There's AMLA, yep. there's medium size, and there's boutique and small firms. Yep. There are three different, there are different dynamics going on in these different demographics. AMLA tends to be much more aware, big law tends to be much more aware of these issues. Uh, the ABA, Betty Ford, uh, I mean, the ABA wellness pledge, they sign on. The ABA has a, the American Bar Association, you know, they, they have this, there's this symbiotic kind of relationship uh, because the big law firms have the resources generally to put all these things in place, right? So they have the resources to bring in the mindfulness courses, the this, the that. A lot of them have now wellness directors. Uh, so from that, that standpoint, they put in things in place, but there is a dis there's also the disconnect where, well, uh, you're laying off people. You're also laying off people. Uh, the people you still have are maybe overworked. There is, is the message really getting through? I urge the people at the top, the name partners, the partner, uh, the uh, practice group partners, the practice group leaders to evaluate whether the top down message is being stopped at you. Okay, whether you're, whether you're the cork to keep it from getting down. Because it has to be more than throwing resources at people. It has to be understanding the story. It has to be compassionate community. Do the people under you really believe that you care? Right. The people, do the people under you really believe that you think of them as a human being versus a commodity? And so I urge everyone uh, within a large and even medium law firm setting, although medium's a total, you get below big law and it's a totally different dynamic. A lot of them couldn't care less. They, they believe, and I say this anecdotally, but I've heard this more than once. <laughs> and this, <clears throat> this is, by the way, where most of the lawyers practice, of course. So That's right, that's so right. We, we they don't talk know about, about 80% of lawyers that are in firms are 10 or less. Yeah, I'm sorry, we have a delay. They don't know about the Betty Ford study. They don't know about, uh, some of right. them may not even know what the lawyer's assistance programs offer. So it's a different conversation. It's, it's, not a, it's not a hopeless conversation, but it's a much different conversation. And how do we penetrate? How do we sell, right? How do you sell a wellness message? Because you really are selling. 
But it still comes down to empathy, compassion, and understanding that every lawyer beneath you, laterally and above you, is a human being who has a story. Do you want to know the story? It doesn't mean you have to know every detail of their life. They may not want to tell you every detail of their life. But do you at least make an effort to know the story and let them know you care about the story? Part of what we're seeing, as, as well as this long-lasting uh, stigma around mental health issues in, in legal and law firm leaders and, and others maybe not being willing to show the vulnerability in terms of how they've struggled themselves and so on. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that as being a hurdle in I the mean, legal vulnerability profession? Vulnerability and shame are the linchpins to mental health, mental health recovery, right? Uh, shame keeps, shame pre often prevents us from being vulnerable, shame and stigma. We are socialized and quote unquote educationalized, <laughs> that's not a word, it is now, as a profession to really take advantage of vulnerability, not allow ourselves to be vulnerable vulnerable in the adversarial process. That's what we do. We look right. for weaknesses. We don't explore our own weaknesses. And it is a weakness to explore weakness in ourselves. Right. And that isn't something, that's stigma. And in the legal profession, we have layers, we have multiple layers of stigma, which creates a bigger problem. We have the general shame stigma that over the bubble, over recovery and addiction and depression in general, right? that come from years and years and years of treating it as weakness, treating it as a choice, treating it as something that is contagious so we don't talk about it. We, we can bring the societal stigma into the firm, into our solo practice, into our law firm. And then we have the legal stigma on top of that. And we're not done there. Stigma is often presented as a one size fit all. Not every demographic views stigma the same way. And you may have different demographics within the law firm. A solo practitioner may have come from a culture that views stigma differently. Someone in your law firm may come from a demographic that views stigma differently, whether it's a racial, ethnic, or whatever. There are different cultural views to stigma and we try to do it as a one size fit all and that doesn't always work. So somebody may have even a third level of stigma that they don't feel comfortable going to their wellness officer. And this is why it's so important for, uh, especially in big law, we'll start because they have these, the diversity officers and the heads of diversity and the wellness, heads of wellness to work together, or if you don't have a head of wellness, HR, to work together to understand that. Brian, one thing we, we talked about at the very beginning of the show is, is the fact that the landscape for you in terms of speaking about you know, mental health issues and recovery in the legal profession is, is transforming amidst this pandemic. You're, you're not going into the, the large law firms and, and giving talks. And yet it's, it's at a time where uh, lawyers probably need to hear from you more than, more than ever. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you're pivoting and evolving your uh, your services and your offerings. Sure. Uh, I, I had I, I had a little bit of sense when this all started happening that before our lockdown, I went in and uh, recorded my keynote on green screen in a room painted green screen. And, and so that was interesting because it allowed me to use graphics and it allows me to do a lot of different things. And so I'm going to start offering my uh, presentation, my full presentation via people on demand and the Mississippi Bar just used it. But, in the, but again, we're only three months in. I don't know what's going to happen any more than anyone else does. But taking things one day at a time, that's one thing I've done. But th uh, this is interesting. Your, your keynote presentation, law firm leaders, bar association leaders, they can approach you and, and potentially stream this to their members as, uh, as a member benefit? They, they, they can. And one of the things I keep in mind is that when I've gone into big law firms uh, before, this, before the lockdown, I'm, I was generally only presenting to a lunchroom crowd regardless, 15 people, 20 people who were uh, decently physically distanced regardless. Right. And so what they did was stream it out to all their satellite offices. So I'm, I have a tentative confidence that I can get back to some sort of presentation on that level. But we have, I, have to, I keep in mind that lawyers are losing their jobs. Solos can't continue. There are a lot worse problems going on than my being able to walk into a law firm 
and, and, and present. Well, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about the other side of, of lawyers that maybe need to hear your message uh, more than, than ever. And I, I think one silver lining to all of this and, and one silver lining to events shifting online to an extent is that it does increase reach people that weren't able to attend them in person. It does. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing the webinars. We're seeing this. We're seeing that. Uh, if, I, if I never hear the term webinar again, uh, <laughs> that's all this is over. But it, I, 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 I call it virtual presentation. But, uh, and we'll yeah, people a, probably get sick of that too, or Zoominar, <laughs> Zoominar. We'll there we go. Zoominar. You've coined two new words in this, yeah. uh, in this podcast. That's right. But uh, I also keep in mind that law firms are figuring it out as they go too. The, the profession is figuring it out as they go. And we are all, every, a lot of people are struggling to pay their rent and a lot of people are struggling to stay connected. So it's going to be a process. This is, we're not even, we're in our uh, third month now going into our third month. This is going to be a process. And I think that law firms will figure out how to work. Uh, my hope is that we can all stay above water while trying to do so because, and stay as mentally balanced as possible while we try to do so, because this is going to be an evolution that uh, is a first for all of us. So, and, and I've really enjoyed our conversation, Brian. A couple of questions to, to close out. Uh, COVID-19 is accelerating changes that were already underway in so many industries. I, I'm curious, do you, are you hopeful that this will accelerate some of the changes that you hope to see in the profession as it relates to mental health and I'm hoping it will, um, yes, I'm hoping it accelerates the attention we pay to where the majority of the profession resides down below AMLAW. AMLAW is important. AMLAW has resources. I know solos who are struggling to pay their rent right now, uh, yeah. who had to get their PPP and all these different things. And medium firms too, struggling, struggling. And so there are a lot of, the social isolation is, is big right now, not just uh, with the lawyers in AMLAW, but below that. And uh, where they may not necessarily be connected to the bar, local or state bar, they may not necessarily uh, understand what the lawyers' assistance programs have to offer. We need to work hard because this was a problem before the lockdown. That the message, in my opinion, and maybe the ABA or others will disagree, that in my opinion, from an anecdotal standpoint of people I personally talk to, this message uh, just wasn't penetrating this wellness message of what's available. And so I'm hoping that this accelerates because as we, we can circle back around, I'm expecting things to get worse before they get better in terms of mental health. I think they will get better. We have wonderful advocates out there. Patrick Creel is out there, Lisa Smith. We have, we have all these wonderful people out there trying to make a difference and making a difference. And I think there will be a gradual turn, but I do think that we're gonna, there are some struggles ahead. Uh, that's great. And I think that's a, an optimistic tone to, uh, to end on. And, and to wrap up on our, our final question, Brian, what do you want people to understand about mental health, mental illness, addiction, and eating disorders that is, is often misunderstood? That they are not choice. They are the first time here that the first time I snorted a line of cocaine in that bathroom in Dallas, Texas was a choice. It was the choice driven by a lot of psychological issues, but it was a choice. The biological brain based process that took over that turned into an obsessive compulsive desire to obtain that drug in the face of known consequences was not a choice. These things are not choices. They are not moral failings. Let's be compassionate, let's be empathetic, let's be understanding of that. Because that is important to break stigma. And recovery is possible. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Brian. Really enjoyed our conversation and thank you for the, the important work you're doing in the profession. Thank you for having me, I really enjoyed this. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters today, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. 
Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit clio.com.